In the news this week, office printers found to be vulnerable, people locked up in their hotel rooms for ransom, and in the midst of it, some people claiming that you don't even need an antivirus at all. Ugh. This is Leo, and welcome to Security Talk, episode 10. So, who doesn't need antivirus? Robert O'Callaghan thinks quite a lot of people. I mean, this has kind of become a trend where um, every couple of weeks, there's someone with the profile of security researcher or long-term developer who makes a bold statement claiming that antivirus tools are useless or people don't need antivirus, Windows Defender is good, you know, all that fun stuff. And this time it's a Firefox developer. So in response to him saying that people should delete their antivirus program, Kaspersky in panic have released a counter argument in the form of this article. And obviously this is a biased source. Their entire business depends on people using antivirus programs, but they do have some valid points. Now there are several arguments that people make when it comes to using security programs. I'll even give it a name. The no antivirus hypothesis. It has a weak version and a strong version. The weak version is that smart people don't need an antivirus. And the strong version is that most people don't need an antivirus. I'm gonna try to debunk both of those arguments, but I think I'm going to have to make a dedicated video for that. It's way too long to completely discuss in this uh, security talk. But for now, I'll give you this. Point one, nobody gets infected while they're aware of it or know what they're doing. When was the last time you heard a ransomware victim say, oh, you know, I was aware that I was gonna be in tremendous risk when I was doing this. I totally considered the possibility that I might be infected by ransomware, but I just decided to take the risk. Nobody ever says that. Nobody believes that they're going to get infected. It just happens. People resent the fact that they don't have backups or don't have security programs after they are infected. Until then, everybody's getting along just fine. So saying that being careful or being cautious while you're using the internet or doing something or knowing what you're doing is enough to protect you from threats is kind of a pointless statement. That's obvious. The unfortunate thing is, there are always going to be cases where people don't know what they're doing or something's going on that they don't understand, and that can happen with anyone, even the best of us. Which brings me to the second point that is, people make mistakes. It's not anyone's fault. It's in human physiology. Humans aren't perfect and they're bound to be careless. I myself have had several bad incidents in the past. I'm not going to elaborate in detail. Once again, teaser, upcoming video discussion. But the point is, as people, we're going to be careless sometimes. We're going to make mistakes, regardless of how smart you are or how aware you are of cybersecurity in general. Which is why some level of machine automated backing is always helpful when you falter. As for the whole Windows Defender argument, uh, Kaspersky have some facts for us, and uh, this is not a biased source, this is AV Test, their results comparing Kaspersky Internet Security and Windows Defender. Now, I do not take these results as a complete word of authority, but it's clear for anyone to see that Windows Defender falls well below the standards when it comes to anti-malware products. I know some people are just gonna hate what I'm saying and they're not even gonna think about it, but I mean, seriously, look at the evidence, look at the detection ratios. Windows Defender lags most popular AV products by a factor of like 20 to 30%. Some people are okay with that and uh, that's fine. I, I'm not telling you not to use it, but just be aware that it is not the best in the business when it comes to security. It's not the best at signatures, it barely has any zero-day protection, it's light on the system, and that's great. But it definitely lags behind when it comes to protection. Which is why I always recommend running some kind of firewall or combination if you're planning on using Windows Defender. Again, this is kind of a long topic, and if I get into it, uh, we're probably going to have an hour-long security talk. 
I'll try to cover these kind of things in more discussions in the future, but this video is about news and not about my views, so <laughs> we're just gonna keep it here for now. Moving on to the next topic. In Austria, a top-level hotel was ransomed by cyber criminals, and as an effect, all guests were locked out of their rooms or locked in their rooms, which is probably even worse. So this hotel had all their, you know, door mechanisms automated. And surprisingly, there was no, like, manual override, which I think is really dangerous. I mean, that's, that's like the cliché artificial intelligence horror movie scenario. You should never have systems like this which are completely automated and cannot be overridden manually. It's just a terrible idea in general. I'm sure they had some kind of manual intervention system, but it would have taken way too long, and it was a busy time. So they ended up paying a huge amount of ransom to the cyber criminals to get their systems operational again. And I think after this incident, they're planning to get rid of the whole, you know, door automation mechanism. The ransom amount in this case was 1,500 euros, which I guess is not too bad given the situation. I'm sure if the hackers knew the plight of the hotel staff, they could have easily asked for more. But, uh, well, another great example as to why IoT is a bad idea, at least in its current form, and we're not quite ready for all-out automation just yet. This has been told over and over and over again, and nobody seems to care. And if this continues, eventually we'll be looking at a security nightmare. Good business for some, and a uh, terrible time for others. On that note, did you know that your office printer is vulnerable to being hacked? And you'll be surprised at the amount of information that that can give away. For example, the documents you print could be intercepted, valuable data could be stolen, then again it can lead to a ransom scenario and whatnot. So this was discovered in a research conducted of 20 common office network printers, and it turned out they had a variety of uh, vulnerabilities. And in many cases, they were even able to stress the printers causing physical damage in less than 24 hours. So for Wendell, building his own printer robot, be careful out there. You never know when it's going to turn on you. <laughs> right. Moving on to the next topic, China clamps down tighter on VPN. Ah, uh, if you're not aware, China was doing walls before it was cool. I'm sure you've heard of the whole Great Firewall of China thing. Surprise, surprise, they want to censor your internet access. But now, they're coming up with different approaches to even block VPN traffic. Now here's the thing, if you're based in China, they can make it illegal for you to do certain things, but that only applies to people who are based in China. When it comes to VPNs, there are VPNs all around the world, and uh, a Chinese citizen could just purchase a VPN from another website. Even if they block the website, they might just travel outside and purchase and then come back. You get it, right? It's um, not a very difficult thing to do. And once they have access to that VPN, now they can communicate with uh, the rest of the world using encrypted streams. So China cannot censor that. But they've been doing all sorts of data analysis, traffic analysis, and they're coming up with new and improved ways of blocking VPNs in zero day. They might just block the, um, you know, popular providers, but even then, I mean, new VPN companies come out all the time, someone can run their own VPN. So for that, they're still working on ways to eliminate that. Well, good luck if you're in China. I think China is the one place where it was 1984 before 1984. Wow. <laughs> now, coming back to another country which has an absolutely clean record when it comes to spying on its citizens, a couple of individuals were arrested in London for the um, CCTV network hack that occurred during Inauguration Day. For those of you who aren't aware, on Trump's Inauguration Day, there was a cyber attack against a lot of CCTV or IP cameras and that totally disoriented the monitoring systems and it was a terrible situation. Luckily, the IT guys over there were able to get them back online just in time so that the ceremony wouldn't be affected. 
Now, people have been coming up with all sorts of theories as to who did this, ranging from Bigfoot to um, Russia and so on. You get it. And obviously, the smart people are like, oh, it's probably some 15-year-old playing around. But it turns out it's it's not even that. It's a couple of guys in London, which is really interesting because, I mean, the first suspect for me would be Trump haters in the U.S. itself, given the nature of protests that we had on Inauguration Day. But it turns out it was, it was two 15-year-olds, so it wasn't 15-year-olds either. We were all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but people in London aren't to blame for all of the problems in the US. Some people are just jerks. So it turns out there was a Federal Reserve staff mining bitcoins on his work computer and now he's been fined $5,000, which I think is kind of generous. This is not really like a deep topic. There isn't much to um, get into here, but I included it anyway because, well, Bitcoin mining is a thing, and uh, we're seeing a lot of malware do that. So if you're not aware what Bitcoin mining even is, it's a resource-intensive task which you perform in order to help other projects. And in return, they pay you in cryptocurrency. That's kind of a very incorrect breakdown of how it actually works, but you get the point. But here's the thing, you need a really powerful computer to do Bitcoin mining, or you need a good GPU. And usually, unless you're using specific hardware, the money you'll be making off of that won't even compensate for your losses in terms of electricity. So it's very tempting for people to do this on other people's computer. And we've seen different uh, malicious applications do that, different torrent clients, things like that. They don't tell you, uh, but it's hidden somewhere in their license agreement, and they're just going to mine your computer while you're not doing anything. The smaller version of that is people like this guy, who are like, well, let me just make use of my school computer or my office computer. So it's just something to watch out for. If you're seeing a ton of CPU activity and you're not doing anything, you probably have one of these on your tail, or in your tail, because <laughs> you're already infected. So watch out for this crap, and uh, that is going to conclude the security talk for today. I'm going to try to do this show weekly from now on, so you can look forward to it every weekend. And if you want to discuss any of these topics, you can do so in the comments, or better even, on the forums. Please let me know your thoughts, give me your feedback. I'd really love to hear that. And uh, subscribe, because you don't want to miss out on those discussion videos. I do intend on making a few points there. And if you want to help me out, get us a few upgrades, you can support me on Patreon. So I hope you had a great week. Thank you for watching. This is Leo, and as always, stay informed, stay secure.